Well, praise the Lord. I got my morning hike in there. Yeah, here we go. It's, it's on, isn't it? Yeah, okay. Praise the Lord. Yeah, I said I got my morning hike in. It's certainly a lot, a lot further <laughs> to come, but praise God. I'm so glad for the Lord's mercy to us this morning. And uh, all of you get to sit closer together now. But I know the Lord is faithful. You know, I've, I had, uh, I've had some thoughts come to me, and I'm just going to trust the Lord with them this morning. My mind went to a basically a phrase that came out of something that Paul wrote to the Corinthian believers in 2 Corinthians, and I'm just going to use it as a kind of a kickoff point. Uh, it's evident from the context that the church there had had to deal with something in a particular person that was very serious, morally, whatever it was. It was some, they had to really, you know, deal with it very plainly. And uh, I don't know what form of discipline, they, whether they disfellowship the guy or whatever it was, but whatever had happened in between First and Second Corinthians, uh, the person had repented. And so Paul was concerned that, you know, we need, to, we need to know how to move forward here. We can't just sit there and let, let this situation hang. You can't just sit there and look at this brother like a second-class brother. And, you know, th there's a, there was a certain amount of fallout and, and the sense of where do we go from here? And so this is in, uh, he encourages them to en encourage the brother to receive him, to love him, to forgive him. And Paul says, I'm, I'm right there with you. I forgive him. Uh, let's put this in the past and move forward. Isn't that a good thing? The devil really loves to, it loves to cause us to cling to the past and just stay there. And, uh, you know, you feel discouraged because of what you were or what something that happened or something that somebody did to you. And, you know, God help us. We need to leave the past in the past. Learn how to lay it at the cross and start every morning fresh and new with the Lord. Wouldn't that be a good idea? Yeah, God wants to set us free. Of course, we know the devil has other plans. And so, in the context of this, Paul says, I have in verse, uh, where is this? Someplace in verse 11, -ish, somewhere near there. I have forgiven in the name of uh, Christ, in the sight of Christ for your sake, in order. Now, for what purpose? Why is this, why is this important? In order that Satan might not outwit us. For we are not unaware of his schemes. And, you know, I, th I thought about this because, you know, we've had a lot of emphasis at, at times recently about being awake and alert and all of that, and because the devil is a roaring lion. We know the Scripture pictures him in one place as a, as a dragon who deceives the whole world, and sometimes it's easy to think of him in the in this sense of a, an open onslaught of some kind. There's an attack that's coming from out here, and it's just, you know, he's, he's, it's a forward attack. But I think God wants us to realize in a deeper way and learn a little bit more about the enemy. You know, when you're going to war, now we've got a lot of military folks, I'm not one of them, but you know, if you're in, at war and you're going to war with an, with an enemy, don't you uh, think it's a good idea that you learn something about the enemy? Yeah, you don't just charge off and grab your weapons and go, go to war. You want to study as much as you can, learn as much as you can about them. What's their motivation? How do they operate? Uh, what are their weaknesses? What are their strengths? How can we use this information to our advantage so we can accomplish what we want to in the war? And, you know, I was thinking about this in the context of, of dealing with the devil and, and all of his influences in our lives. It's wonderful to have this idea, I need to be alert for the devil, but if we don't know how he operates, if we don't understand his tactics and what makes him tick, you know, there's going to be times that he sneaks up and he'll pull something and we're not even aware what's going on behind the scenes. We need to realize, again, like we've said so many times, that we're not living in just the world that we detect with our senses. There is a spiritual uh, kingdom around us that is devoted to undermining everything that God says and everything that He does. And we are in a war against Him every single day on a personal level, on a level of an assembly. And there are things that He wants to do. And Paul was concerned here that 
that the devil could continue to stir this, the feelings up that, that came from this circumstance and, and keep on trying to divide the people and, and just basically interfere with the presence of Christ. You know, uh, Burton read the other night from Psalm 133 about the blessedness of people who dwell together in unity. Well, do you see how in this instance the devil would have used things that had happened to create, to continue to create a sense of division in the people? And so that was the issue here. But the, the thing that drew me to it was the fact that Satan is not just, this doesn't mount just frontal assaults, but he has a lot of tricky, behind-the-scenes ways of working on us. And I believe God wants to shine the light in our lives in deeper ways. Don't you believe that? Don't you believe that God wants us to understand? I mean, suppose you're defending your house. And you've got, a, you've got the whole family geared up to watch that front door. Nobody's getting in here. But what happens if uh, the back door is unlocked? And I think in more ways than we realize, we've got back doors in our lives that God wants us to be more aware of. Amen. And, and just, uh, you know, be, be more alert and, and, and more knowledgeable as Christians. You know, as I thought about this, I don't know, Lord, have to help me with this, because I, I thought about looking at, all, at a lot of this from the devil's point of view. Some of you have, may have read, a few of you may have read, what was it, the book by C.S. Lewis, Screw Tape Letters? A few, I've heard, I heard one yell, I see a couple of heads nodding. And you remember what it was, it was kind of a, a fictional story, but it was meant to shine light on human nature and our vulnerabilities, the openness that, we, that exists in human lives because of sin, because of our separation from God. And the, the premise of the book, well, I won't spend a lot of time, but the premise of the book was a, a, a demon or a devil who was experienced was writing exchange, an exchange of letters with a, a uh, junior devil who was trying to learn his trade is how to, tr how to tempt and undermine human beings. And so they're going back and forth, and it's a discussion of human nature. And it says, here's something you need to know about human nature. Here's how you get to them. But don't you realize, don't we realize that there, we have an enemy who has studied us? Their assignment, their, their nature drives them to do everything they can to learn everything they can about us and our vulnerabilities. Wouldn't it be a good thing if we kind of knew more about them so that we could be more ready? Certainly not, not a point of, of fearfulness, but rather of, of our ability to be alert and of sober mind. Because sober mind doesn't just blow off everything and think I can just skate, uh, skate along, I'm smart enough, I'm good enough. My God, do we need Him? As soon as you start down that road, you've already walked onto the devil's territory without realizing it. And I think God wants to teach us and, and grow us up in this area so that we can overcome. Because here, here Paul was saying, we're not ignorant. We're not unaware of Satan's schemes. You have that same uh, expression over in, in Ephesians 6, where, where the schemes of Satan are referred to, Paul talks about the, the, weapon, the warfare and so forth. We've read that scripture so many times. But it says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God. Why? So that you can take your stand. It doesn't say against the devil's frontal assault. It would include that. But rather his schemes. God wants us to be so alert and walking with him in such a way that when the Satan tries to slip up on us, we can know it detect it, and learn how to take our stand and overcome. Anybody here need this? Yes. Yeah, I sure do. Now, just think about this from the devil's point of view. You know, let's take a, a spirit who's been around all this time through human history, and there was a time when uh, and he could look around and say, well, you know, we've got a whole world. Uh, my, I know my existence is you know, there's a judgment coming, but that's way down the line. My, whole, my existence now is trying to, trying to gratify my, my nature and my desires through human flesh and blood human beings. And, and I, I see the world as just a great big smorgasbord, 
a great big cafeteria. You got people out here that don't have a clue. All they're doing, their whole world is what they can see and taste and touch. They got earthly desires. Man, I got a million and one ways that I can get hold of them and, and use them and make my home in them in many cases. And so let's just go to town. Let's just analyze each person and find out what makes them tick, what, what's important to them. And all we have to do is, is tempt them. They're blind. They're separated from God. Let's go to it. And that's, that's pretty much the way the world was, wasn't it? And it's, it looked like from their point of view, man, we got this, we got this world you know, conquered. We serve somebody who has deceived the whole world, and this whole world is his kingdom. He rules over it. Of course, I know that pesky old God, he interferes every now and then, and we don't like that much, but, uh, and we know there's something coming. We just don't know what it is, but right now we're, we're enjoying ourselves, and boy, you know, when I get through with this one person that I'm living in, and I get all my desires satisfied, and, and I use them up, guess what? They die and they go on, but I get to move to the next generation. And I've probably got somebody in their family that's learned their ways, is like them, you know, has, has learned how to see the world through their eyes. I, I've already conditioned them and I can just simply step out of them and move into their life and take them over and it just goes from generation to generation. Man, life is good. Obviously, you know, I'm point, talking to, from the devil's point of view here. <laughs> And then, oh, I remember that day, though, when I was, some of my friends and I were hanging out in a, in a region called Galilee, and we were having a blast just living our lives and living through people and making them do all kinds of stupid stuff, foolish stuff, sorry about that. And uh, they, there they were, and, and so, and here we were just minding our own business. All of a sudden, somebody comes and we recognize him. Oh my God, I know who that is. That's Jesus, the Son of God. Have you come to torment us? You know, leave us alone. Go away, Jesus. We know who you are. And of course, Jesus would come along and drive them right out, and all of a sudden they'd have to go find, find some, someplace else, to, somebody else to mess with. But you know, basically still, the, the great un, amount of the population was still in a position where the devil just had open season. All he had to do was appeal to human nature in some fashion, find the weakness, and just move in and gratify his evil nature through human flesh. That's what this world is about. Folks, that's what this present age is about. My God, we need to be alert and awake and aware as we never have. Well, then, of course, Jesus, they, they, they began to mount all kinds of opposition against Jesus. We got, to, we got to stir up these religious leaders. We already got them in our pocket. They don't know it. They think they're serving God, but we know better. We've, we've actually taken all of the things that God showed them, and we've brought it down to a nice, comfortable religion where people feel good about themselves. They feel righteous in God's eyes because of what they do and they look down on other people. Man, we got them in our back pocket. So we need to get rid of this Jesus. We need to do whatever he's got planned. We got to get rid of him. And so, of course, they did without realizing that that was God's plan. <laughs> and so they had that, the big party. Man, we, we, got a, we got a party because we just, we just put him in a grave. We, made a, we ins, insulted him. We abused him. We ridiculed him, and there we have the victory. Man, it was our day, and we were, we were rejoicing until three days later. All of a sudden, he bursts forth from that grave, and there's not a devil in hell that could keep him in there. Oh, my God, what's happened? And all of a sudden, they realized his plan is the one this is, the, this is the plan he's carried out. This is why he came. Now he's in a position to do something to reach out to men who are, cold, who are helpless and lost, have no hope in this world, people that were just totally vulnerable to our rule and reign. And here we are, and here's, here's this Jesus. And not only has he come forth from the grave, he's ascended to a throne. And then 
We've got all these people that are, that are left behind and all they're doing is waiting. And we've got to come up with a plan. We've got to do something. And then the, the power of God's Spirit comes down upon the people upon, on the day of Pentecost. And they're standing there in the temple. I'll debate that with you if you want sometime. But they're standing there in the temple. And all of a sudden, the power of God shakes the place. And His power, His Spirit rests upon these ordinary people, fishermen, some of them, tax collector. And there they are. And suddenly, the one who was the biggest failure steps up. Something's changed. What's going on? We had this guy licked. We had him beat. We would put him on the sidelines. He, he thought he was done. And now here he is, the very one who's standing up with power and declaring that Jesus is Lord. The salvation has come. You've stood, you've taken your place. People that are listening, you've taken your place against God. You've just, you killed his anointed. There in his his, here his plan is, is, is something that's, and you're on the opposite side. His plan is in motion. You're, you're his enemies. Oh, my God, what do we do? And so, you know the story of how God, God spoke through Peter. Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus, for the remission of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And on that day, 3,000 people escaped Satan's clutches and his kingdom. Praise God. And the devils are sitting there. Oh my God, we got to do something. And then day by day goes on and people are coming to the Lord and they, they have that occasion when they, they, Peter heals the, the cripple at the temple and has a tremendous opportunity to preach the word. We got to do something. Let's arrest him, threaten him. And they do. And the, and the people call on God and they say, Look, you, Father, we, we know that what's unfolding is your plan. Give us courage to stand against this. The enemy is mounting. You see the devils just reacting. We've got to oppose this by every means possible. And so God pours out his spirit, and for a while there's nothing much they can do. But you know, you see the, the demons just doing everything in their power, and God begins to allow them to persecute, to oppose openly. And so people have to stand up, and there are some that, like Stephen and, and James, the, the apostle, who were, who were killed, and others were scattered, and all the things that happened, uh, you know, we, we all know the story. But do you see the hand of Satan? Of course, obviously at this point, he is doing everything in his power to oppose. This is a frontal assault. We've got to attack these people, get them to give all this up. We've got to defeat them. And it didn't work, did it? Because God gave his people the courage to die if necessary. That's how real. That's how real this has to be. That's how real the kingdom of God has to be. That our lives in this world cease to be worth hanging on to if it means giving him up. And so God had a people. And you can see how the devil, devils would get together and say, man, we've got to do something. We'll keep up the pressure because that, that affects some people. They'll give up. I mean, we see that there are people who kind of come on and they, they like some of the ideas. They like the idea of forgiveness of sins and going to heaven one day, but they haven't really, really given their hearts to it. And it, they're just trying to, trying to take on this stuff to, uh, that makes them feel better, but they've never really, really received his spirit, never had that changed heart on the inside. We can get rid of some of them if we'll just put the pressure on. I mean, you remember Jesus' words about those that were with the, the seed that landed on the shallow soil when persecution arose? And they were out of there. But time went along, and, and, all, and, and there was still there was a reality in, a heart, in, in hearts of people. Can you see what the devil would be trying to do? We got to somehow undermine the message itself. We've got to introduce false doctrine. You remember our master was tempting Jesus, and Jesus came back at him with the word, didn't he? Satan tempted him with, you know, you're hungry, make bread if you're the son of God. And he said, it's written, man shall not live by bread only, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And the devil says, aha, this is somebody who knows the word and goes by the word. I better use the word if I'm going to get to him. 
And so he used the word, but he twisted it, didn't he? And so the devil, one of the devil's main tactics early on in the church in the New Testament was to begin to introduce false doctrine. He would take something that was true, but he'd take it out of its context and away from its original purpose, and suddenly it would be something that would divide people, that would bring people into a, into a place of ignorance and a place of vulnerability to their power. My God, God wants us to have such a grasp of His Word in balance so that we can stand and we can recognize every trick of the enemy. I'll guarantee there's people right here, right now, that Satan has more influence and more hold in our lives than he should. And God wants to set His people free, starting with me. I need to be set free from his lies, from his tricks, things that he plants in my mind and my heart because he's, he's studied me all my life. He knows my weaknesses. He knows how to get to me. And I'll tell you, we've got a God who is faithful to his people. And what, let's just, I thought about using uh, Ephesians 6. We've obviously gone through this from many points of view, but this is from the devil's point of view now, remember? So we're talking about the devil's schemes. So our struggle, of course, he says, as we've often pointed out, is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Okay? So your problem is not people. If you've got a problem with somebody you better recognize there's, a, there's, a, there's something behind that that's the real issue. The devil will come at you and at me in every possible angle, using every possible tactic based upon our weaknesses. I don't know, I have, you could, you, I mean, you could obviously spend a lot of time and many messages exploring this kind of subject about how the devil works, basically, is what, it, what it's about. But I, I, I feel like I want to get to one particular area that's very important. All right? Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the evil day, not if, but when the evil day or day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Has there ever been a time in the history of humanity when truth has been under, under attack? Here we are. There's no such thing as truth to a lot of our culture. More and more of our culture does not see absolute truth as, as anything to be concerned about. There's no such thing. I got my truth. You got your truth. We got what appeals to us and what seems right to us, and it's all good. And don't you dare suggest otherwise, otherwise you're the bad guy. And I, I, am, I am tolerant of everybody who agrees with me. That's the spirit behind so much of what you see out there. I'm very tolerant. And if you don't agree with me, you're intolerant. Well, <laughs> We need to realize, and, I, and God's people, and young people growing up today, because you're, you're exposed to all this culture. You're exposed to things that are far worse than we grew up with. And you got people that you know, and Satan will plant people in your path and in your life who will try to plant in you a relativism where there is no absolute truth. You need to follow your heart. Well, <laughs> Scripture says those one who follows his heart is a fool. Because the heart, out of man's heart is evil. The one we're born with is evil. We need a, that's why we need a new one. And God's plan is to deal with all of these issues and to, and to give us a full and complete salvation. Thank God. It's salvation, too. It's not a self-help program. It's something where I have to give myself completely to Him and trust in His power to save me because I have none. And oh, we've got, to have a, we've got to have this sense that there is truth that we need to recognize 
This is how it is. This is what God says, and that trumps everything else. I don't care how, how Satan packages it, makes it appealing. Because, folks, if, you're, if there's some part of your nature that has a hold on you, whether it's a bodily lust or whether it's pride or whether it's trying to obtain something or uh, gain a position in the eyes of others, Satan will pull on that and he will give you a rationale that will make it seem okay. You know what a rationale is? You've already decided something, but now you've got to come up with a reason so it makes it seem okay. Instead of it being rooted 100% in the truth. And God calls us to walk in the light, to walk in the truth. So that's why our, that's, that becomes the central thing right there. We've got to recognize there is such a thing as absolute truth, and we need the Lord to reveal it to us and to give us a heart that surrenders to that truth, even when, especially when it shows our own need. Praise God. But the second thing I think is where my mind went to more than any other when I was thinking about all this. The belt of truth buckled around your waist, but with the breastplate of righteousness in place. Now, what is righteousness about? Think about what that means. It means being right with God. It means God regarding us as right with Him. It, it, Satan, or sin has absolutely built a impenetrable barrier between us and God. Impenetrable to us. All you have to do is go back to, the, to what the Lord showed Isaiah. Who, all of his experience was down here, and he thought of some people as good and some people as evil and all of that. And then all of a sudden, the Lord catches him up, and he sees the Lord high, lifted up, utter purity. In one moment, he knew the truth about, not just about the, the Lord, but about himself, didn't he? Oh, my God. If we're going to walk in truth, we're going to have to see that as a starting point. But here is the situation God is dealing with. He has determined and has purposed and will successfully call a people out of this and make them fit to live in a place like that. Do you need the Lord? Oh my, that's the only, the only hope that I have. You can come here and be faithful and sing all the songs all your life and, and miss out completely on this. We need the Lord to do a saving work and, and to give us an understanding of righteousness. So what's the Lord's plan in this? We find out, and Satan certainly is better, know, knows this better than a whole lot of professing Christians, that when Jesus died, he paid it all. Once for all, he died for those that God is calling into his kingdom. When he laid down his life, he went there in my place. That gives God the freedom to have punished my sin in him. And when I come to him with an open, repentant heart, he has the power, the right to blot out all of my guilt, to remove the barrier that separates me from him. I think the devil knows far better than we do that salvation and God's purpose is all about a relationship, an open, pure, free relationship between us and a holy God. Okay, well, if you're the devil, what are you going to be doing? You've got to undermine that somehow, don't you? And so plan A is to, is to undermine that idea, to so focus on being the accuser of the brother's that you focus the person's attention on their need and somehow it just can't quite be applicable to me. Oh, this is wonderful for brother and sister so-and-so, but, but poor old me, look at me, I'm such a, I'm so bad, I could never. And somehow he undermines the confidence, the, the, the ability to let go and let God have his way in this, to, be, to understand that God meant what he said that we have that right and that privilege of calling upon Him. Now, we don't call upon Him saying, I'll try harder. 
We are coming to get a righteousness that we did not earn, could never deserve. But it means putting our lives 100% in His hands, saying, God, you are going to have to fix what's wrong with me. And what's wrong with me needs not just fixing, it needs replacing. I need a new heart and a new life. And I just give myself, I humble myself in your hands. We talked about that, you know, humbling ourselves in the mighty hand of God. This is involved in that. But oh, the devil is going to do everything in his mind, in his power, to come to an individual and blind them to the reality of this truth, at, at, at least as it applies to them. And, you know, one of the best ways, one of the best tools he has, you know, I can just see the devil saying, you know, we knew, we knew how to handle it when God came to Moses and then tried to pass all that, that knowledge and that revelation on to God's people. Look, look how we fixed that. Yes, I know there was a whole lot of idolatry along the way, but we still had, there were still people that were so married to that law that we knew we had to, we had to do something. God wanted a relationship. And so the way, I, the way we've got to fix that is we've got to turn that into a self-righteous effort. We've got to corrupt the message so that people don't understand how the relationship is meant to happen. And you call it legalism. And you've got a lot of churches who have devolved into a system where I have got to measure up. Here's what God expects of me. And I am constantly falling short and repenting and then trying harder and trying, you know, falling short and repenting. And, and, and that's, that's my life. But I got to do it because that's what he expects. Amen, amen. Yeah, I don't think you're the only one. But do you see the work of Satan in that? Do you see how he is corrupting the message? There's no question what God wants and what holiness really is about. That's not the issue, but the how do you get there is the issue. And so here's Satan saying, I have got to undermine the gospel. I've got to attack this person. In some cases, you have a person who has never really come to faith, but some people have really come to faith. God has a remnant of people who actually know him. But they've fallen under the influence of people who sound good because they're talking about the holiness of God and all these, all these things, but they don't really have the gospel. They don't understand God's plan and how it works. So here's the devil undermining. My God, do we need a revelation of the finished work of Christ? Do we realize that if there is a genuine heart repentance and faith in his saving power that we can stand before him as if we had never sinned it takes a divine work in the heart to come to that place where we can be his and know that we're his know that we're accepted in the beloved he who knew no sin became was made sin for us why so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Now, one interesting thing about that, that, that we might become, that's again, that, that is that Greek present tense. So it, it's, it's in one sense, we have a standing before God that is secure, but yet become the righteousness of God tells you that there is a process that follows that. Okay? And the devil has all kinds of ways of trying to get somebody who has maybe come to that place. Yes, I believe in the finished work of Christ. I believe that when Jesus died, he took the law with him. We're not under the law anymore. Praise God, we're under grace. Oh my God, the devil says, what am I going to do now? They believe in the finished work of Christ. I've got to come up with something. I know what. I will use the it's all taken care of doctrine. Anybody ever heard that one? Because now, now I can work on a person who has weaknesses. They can look in the Word and say, nowhere does it say I'm going to be perfect. But it's all taken care of. All of my sin. 
has been put on him. Therefore, God understands. I can just, I mean, I, I, I'll stay out of something that's gross. I won't go out and murder people or rob banks, but, you know, God understands that what I'm made of and he's already taken care of it. So pretty soon without meaning to, the devil can take somebody whose particular weaknesses he has nurtured and somehow create a justification where it's okay. God help us. Is that what Jesus died for? You know, we have been set free. But why? Have we been set free so that we can now be free to give vent to our nature? Oh, but it's a, it's a, it's a small, private little thing. I, nobody, it's not hurting anybody. I mean, nobody knows where I go on the Internet and the stuff that I look at and the things I think about. That's just all me and it's private. And the devil's, the devil's sitting there feeding feeding all these things that he has cultivated in us, the weaknesses that we all, we all have, every one of us. If it's not one thing, it's another. But he's sitting there, I've got to keep feeding this. And right now they've, they've got this idea, they, they understand that Jesus paid it all, but now I've got to somehow keep my hold on them. All right, let's come up with a rationale that makes that seem fine. And this is the one where it's, it's all been taken care of at the cross, so I can just... I do the best I can. I, I'll say I'm sorry when I'm done, but basically I'm allowing something to go on in my life. What, that's what it boils down to. So you got, you got one person who is, who, is, who is living for, supposedly for the Lord, but that, yet they're allowing things. And, and I'll tell you, when does the devil come to you most readily? When does he succeed with you most readily? When you're sitting here in the congregation and the Lord is present? Or is it when you're off by yourself? You might even be in the wrong place or around the wrong people. Or you're tired. Man, you're worn out. You know, a lot, there's been a lot of battles in history where somebody, some, one particular army just came in and won a great victory. What did they do afterwards? They went and had a party. And how many times have they wound up being the ones defeated because they weren't watching. They were, they were giving vent to their, night, to their nature and letting down their guard because they had just come off a great high victory. How many times, how many people, I won't ask you for a raise of hands, for, I wonder how many of us have got, come through a time when it's been a, a time of battle or a time of victory, a time of, you know, being around the Lord and, and, and things, you know, going His way and then, You ever had the devil come to you right then and kind of steer you back into think ways of thinking and doing that aren't good? Yeah, I certainly have. You think the Lord wants us to become more aware of those things and more experience more of his victory? Do you think the righteousness that he's talking about is just this legal standing that I have before God, or does he actually want to produce real righteousness? And if so, how? You know, you still got this legalism, like I said, where someone can come to the place where, yes, I know I'm the Lord's, but oh God, I got li to live up to it. I got to, and all of a sudden it becomes saved by grace and kept by works. How's that work out for you? You know, you read, again, you read Romans 7, you discover how Paul learned the hard way. It doesn't work. If I try to serve God, I don't care how zealous I am to keep God's law. It ain't happening because I got something in here that it just won't let me. Oh, God, who's going to set me free? Who's going to deliver me from this body of death? And that's when he realized that's not God's plan. It was never God's plan just to save us, wipe out our sin debt, and give us a ticket to heaven, and then say, go for it and just try to live for me. Because it's all taken care of. Don't worry. But here's Paul saying, it matters that I serve God. But I can't seem to do it. How is this supposed to work? And then he realizes the righteousness of the law, the righteousness of the law, the purpose that it was intended for in the first place, 
is fulfilled in me. Ah, how does that happen? Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. In other words, I need to learn how to lay hold of divine power in all of these little things. I need to learn to recognize it, but then I need to not just to say, oh, here we go again, poor old me, but turn, turn to the Lord and lift and, and call upon his name and look to him and discover not my weakness, but his power to produce in me what he wants. It is a, it's a lifestyle of facing what's wrong with me, but looking to him and laying hold of his provision for that. Oh, the devil's going to do everything in his power to, to undermine that. You know, I thought about this. How, many t how often do we hear about some prominent pastor, religious leader, whatever, suddenly they're caught in some sin, and they're fallen in disgrace, kicked out of their ministry, whatever. The reality is I'm afraid a lot of these aren't the Lord's to begin with. But the fact is some are. I can think of people who had wonderful international ministries. And suddenly it comes to light that there is a weakness. There was an area very privately that they yielded to their flesh in a way that was very God dishonoring. And suddenly the whole thing is just kind of, there's a blanket over the whole thing. It's a scandal before the world. They're able to say, look, you bunch of hypocrites. I'll tell you, the devil is going to do everything in his power to undermine us so that we won't be effective. And we need to have every part of our lives, including the back door and the side window. We need to, we need to recognize we need the Lord. That we can't live these private, self-indulgent, it's okay, it's all taken care of kind of lives. We need the Lord. And we can't do it in ourselves. We just need Him. I thought about something that Paul said over in, uh, is it Romans chapter 9, I think, toward the end of it? Well, praise the Lord, maybe it's 10. Nope. Well, praise God, I had that, in my, had that in my head exactly where that was going to be, and now I can't remember. Yeah, verse, um, all right, I can tell you what the substance was. Where Paul said, I think it's 1 Corinthians, but I'll, I'll skip it right now. Paul was talking about his own ministry and how he was free. Now, he wasn't, that didn't mean I'm free to do as I please, and I'm free to serve my old nature, but I am free but I also recognize that if I am going for a certain objective in my life, compare this to an athlete. If you're going to be a champion athlete, you're going to have to do some sacrifice, aren't you? You can't just eat what you want and do what you want. You have got to discipline your body so that it will behave the way you want it to be so that you will excel. Well, it's the same way in the Christian life. We can't just be careless and do it, do as we please and expect to be effective in the kingdom of God or expect to have victory, expect to have the relationship, this righteous relationship that God wants us to have. And so Paul said, I'll tell you, I beat my body. I keep it under subjection so that after I have, wit I have ministered to others, I myself will not be disqualified is the word, right? Now, Paul didn't say, I'm going to lose my salvation, but how many of the people that, I, that we've heard of that I believe are genuine servants of God, really became disqualified because of their own failure. Do you think that applies only to people like that, or does that apply to every one of us, that God wants us to so walk with Him that He can, he can deal with these areas of our lives, the ones that other people don't even know about, but you do. And you know when you get there that things are not quite like they're supposed to be between you and God, does God not want to have that free, open relationship with us? Is that not available? How in the world does that work? You know, my mind went back to, to 1 John chapter 1 that we've used so many times and John's admonition to walk in the light. 
And I can just hear the devil saying, boy, I hate light. <laughs> I hate it, the purple passion. Everything I do requires that I be able to sneak around and, 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 call, and inject people's brain with thoughts. I need to be able to talk to them. I need to be able to send the right person. I need to take them to the right place. Oh, I need darkness. And I'll drop this in because it's, it, it has its place. I, I remember mentioning a while back the testimony I read of a man that God called out of a horribly corrupt moral lifestyle. Saved him out of it. But a lot of his lifestyle kind of, kind of focused on a particular street in a particular big city. And it was a source of distress to him in the immediate future of his really coming to the Lord, said, God, when I come down that, when I go down that street, all those feelings come back. Oh, I just feel a pull of that. What's wrong? What's wrong? And the Lord said, don't go down that street. You know, there's places that you and I need to not be. Websites you don't need to go to. Movies, TV, you name it. There are things that we need to be able, a little bit more discriminating, all of us. And be aware of what the real message is. God help us. God help me. You, know, you, see, you start seeing Hallmark channels start catering to a certain crowd. That's the world we live in. But there's places in your life where the devil can maneuver you into a place of weakness. You're going to find yourself falling into the same traps that he's used in your past. God wants us to grow and to get stronger. I, I guarantee that same man could probably drive right down that street and be fine today because God's built him up and made him strong in his faith and that thing has lost its hold. But boy, you don't just play with sin. You don't toy with it. You don't mess around and say, oh, well, I can always just go get forgiven. Is that why God's called us? Did he call us? Are we free so that we can give vent to the flesh and kind of toy with it? Or are we set free to serve him and to serve one another in love? Read Galatians 5 as to what, the, what our freedom is about. Yes, we're free from the law, but not free to do as we please. Because the fruit of the flesh is not, not a good thing. We just need him. But oh, we, we need the, the perfect righteousness of Christ, don't we? Put to our account. We need that foundation to stand upon. But, in the, but on that foundation, God is going to be building in us real righteousness in a practical sense. And I need him every moment of every day. And I need him to shine the light in areas of need. Walk in the light the light's going to show us things that may, we might not want to see about ourselves, but it's also going to reveal the devil and how he's working on us. Wouldn't it be a good prayer to say, Lord, please shine the light. Shine the light. Show me where the devil is getting an advantage over me. Show me how to recognize him and what to do and how to defeat him. That's a pretty good description of the Christian life, Father, folks. Walking in the light. But walking in the light, that's terrible because that's going to show all the bad stuff in me and then I'm going to feel bad. Does that sound like the way the devil would have us re react to that? See, he, he recognizes that truth. He says, I've got to do something. I've got, I got to undermine that somehow so that people are just afraid to walk in that light because I need light that's going to show my need. I need to have an honest heart that says, Lord, I know I need you. You know everything that's lacking in me. That's why you saved me. You gave me the, the certificate, if you will, of righteousness, but now you're working to actually make it happen. And I don't know how to do that. I don't even know what's wrong with me, let alone have the power to do anything about it. But I know you do. And I don't want anything to come between us in this process. I want to just walk with you, be willing for you to shine the light wherever it needs to be shined. Rest in that knowledge and that truth, not be anxious, oh my God, oh, I should, you know. 
You see how the devil is going to under, comes in so many different ways to undermine all of this. When God wants that person just to walk with him, and then we discover something that's wrong. Now what? If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Now, what's, is that just sort of an automatic thing? There's actually a part that we play, and that's where he goes into it in the end of that passage. If we confess. Again, what does confessing mean? Is it just admitting? It's an agreement with God. You see, here's somebody who's walking in the light, wanting to experience his righteousness, knowing that they don't have any power, not afraid to face the truth. Oh, the devil's getting scared when he sees all this begin to happen. He's terrified because he knows what's real. We're the ones who mis misunderstand and listen to his little suggestions that kind of undermines this in one way or another. But we're walking in that. We're wanting him to show us our needs and then to help us with them. And that's going to involve us coming short. That's what a need is. If I'm less than he wants me to be, is that not a sin? Is that not something that's wrong? Does that not need help? So what do I do? I go right back to the, to the cross. If, I conf if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Oh, but I messed up. I have got to get it straight before I can face him again. Where does that thought come from? You see how the devil just... He's going to be sitting, he's going to be parked out there trying, desperately trying to undermine every little thing that happens in our lives. And all God wants is this free, open relationship. We first of all trust Him with our soul. We depend on the cleansing power of what happened at the cross. We stand on that foundation. We've got righteousness right here. It's not just what happened then, but it's what He's doing in me right now. And I'm not, yes, there are things that are going to come up that we haven't got there to the future yet. But that's in his hands. I don't have to worry about that. I just walk with him right now. Let him deal with what he's dealing with right now let, and grow and be honest with him. And when there's something that's wrong, I bring it. I don't wait. I bring it right to him right then. And the fellowship never has to be broken. Can't you just hear the devil screaming? When a child of God wakes up and realizes such simple truth and begins to walk in it. But I'll tell you what, I pray that God will, God will help us with these things, help me. And not to feel condemned because I'm not down the road somewhere. And not to worry about the past or be out with this person or that person, just to say, Lord, here I am. I'm in your hands. You know what I need. And I know, and I'm confident in your love because you called me knowing what I am. I don't have to produce righteousness. What I need to do is learn how to submit to yours and trust you to give me the strength and the knowledge and the wisdom to be able to recognize the enemy when he starts talking to me, when he starts maneuvering me to go down that street and I'm not ready. When he puts me in with, this, with these people and I start listening to their way of thinking and their way of doing stuff and to help me to recognize what's going on. Recognize the voice of the enemy. See, it, see beyond the outward circumstances and see a sneaky enemy that isn't always going to mount a, a, an outward offensive. He's going to try to sneak in that back door every weak place that we have. But we can walk with him with confidence because of the cross because of his promise to walk with us to the end of the road, because his promise that we can walk in the light in a place of fellowship, acceptance with him, when he counts us as a righteousness as Jesus himself. Praise God. Oh, wouldn't it be wonderful if, if we all learned these things to the point where they became the operating principle of our lives. 
Anybody here need him this morning? Well, he's available and he longs to walk with every one of us and teach us how to recognize the tricks of the enemy and to be able to stand against them and say, wait a minute, I understand what righteousness means. I got this. You can't get to me, devil. You can accuse me all you want, but I have an answer for every accusation. I know I need a Savior, but I got one. Praise God! And I'm looking forward to standing with, beside Him one day, not because I deserve it, not because of anything I've ever done, but because I just put myself in His hands and let Him save me. And I walked with Him, and He was faithful. Praise God! May God help us to recognize Satan's devices, Satan's schemes, and learn how to stand against them. Learn how to recognize them is the biggest thing, I think. And understand how he works so that we can more effectively stand our ground. And the Lord's going to help us, isn't he? Praise God.